Alrighty, let's get started. Um, for those of you who missed the first half, uh, this is the second part of the FTA best practices guide. Uh, we'll be resuming from where we left off. So if you missed the first half, you can find it on the YouTube recording later. Uh, once again, my name is Alex Lambert. I'm the Ohio lead FDA. So let's pick up where we left off. All right, so robot programming issues. How can oh, we deal with that? All right, so robot programming. So there's a lot of things you can do on the programming side to help you um, troubleshoot issues. Uh, one of the perhaps most useful things when dealing with odd issues is making use of telemetry data uh, to monitor the state of your program and kind of feedback inputs, variables, all kinds of fun stuff. So if you're running into some odd issues, be sure to take a look at using the telemetry data and feeding back information to your uh, driver station mid uh, mid operation. Uh, another thing you want to watch out for is uh, making sure that your configurations, which are essentially the, the settings which link your programmatic variables to your actual hardware on the robot, which is set in the robot controller, uh, making sure those are all correct and up to date. I have seen a couple instances where some teams on the field had the wrong um, the wrong configuration selected and therefore things were just not quite working as expected. Um, issues can pop up if you add or remove sensors, motors, servos, um, and then it's expecting them in your code and not finding them. Um, sometimes they're not a big issue. I've seen color sensor errors pop up and kind of be non-issues, but you know, if it's a, a more crucial sensor or a motor or servo, um, you're going to have some problems. So you can always double check those, make sure you've got everything configured and set up. Um, and make sure that your program variable names match what you put in the configuration because that is important. Uh, additionally, you're going to want to keep up to date on the latest releases from the SDK. They usually include bug fixes for uh, some hot topic issues as well as new features. Um, now that's not to say that you must and should always use the latest possible version. Um, you should always do some testing uh, before you upgrade to the latest version. Uh, to make sure that something in the new SDK release doesn't break your existing code. I recommend using uh, version control. Um, since it's from GitHub, Git would be the logical choice. Uh, you could have a version control for, you know, between different software releases so that you can feasibly test new releases without uh, upsetting everything that you've already done. Uh, uh, for autonomous modes, if you're using a linear op mode, or otherwise known as sequential commands, um, you're going to want to make sure that within your linear op mode, any loops or uh, time duration things are interruptible. Um, so what this means is that if some event were to occur in the middle of program execution, it won't cause the program to be unresponsive or hang. Um, for example, um, if your robot crashes or if you have to stop the robot mid-match for, for one reason or another, um, you want to make sure that it doesn't just keep running off into oblivion um, or spinning in circles or something like that. Now, the, there's a couple ways to do this, but the easiest way to do this is to add a condition to the loops or other time durations to check for whether op mode is active, because if an interruption occurs, op mode will no longer be active. Um, when you're using waiting periods in your program, for example, go forward for two seconds or two and a half rotations or what what not, um, you're going to want to try and make use of the sleep command as your kind of time-based timing, um, because the sleep command is interruptible as opposed to other methods of waiting. Uh, when you're testing and debugging your autonomous program, you can verify whether or not your program is interruptible by starting your autonomous program and then manually stopping it via the uh, program control on your driver station at various points in the program. If you have programmed your autonomous in such a way that it is non-interruptible, what you will find is if you try to stop the program early instead of letting it run to completion, uh, it will just keep executing your program and be unresponsive, which is not what we want. Um, this can be a little tedious to test completely, so you might just try um, some of the critical junctions like large moves or turns or sensing opportunities or things like that. Um, some of the program considerations to keep in mind, um, when you are programming your uh, motors to operate, there are kind of two different methods by which you can set their, their power level or their rotation speed. 
Um, if you have a lot of motors in use at the same time, you're going to want to be mindful that um, depending on what you set could impact uh, other things on your robot. Uh, if you use a speed targeting method, what the robot is going to try to do is uh, dynamically adjust the voltage to try and hit a specific rotation speed. For example, um, if you're trying to climb up a slope uh, or pick up a heavy object and your motors are encountering resistance, it'll try to crank up the voltage to hit your speed target. Now this is all fine and dandy, except for if you have an exceptional amount of resistance, it can result in a very large voltage increase, which will result in a current spike, and thus your battery voltage will overall drop, which could cause problems for other electronics on your robot. So to alleviate this, what you can do is voltage targeting instead, where uh, the load will not change if resistance encountered. Now, that's not to say you should always use this, but you're going to want to keep in mind the consequences of using speed targeting versus voltage targeting and plan appropriately. If you only have a few motors running at the same time, it probably won't be a big issue. But if you're using multiple motors for your drivetrain, multiple motors for arms that are operating together, and you could be operating all of them simultaneously along with maybe some servos, you might want to consider it. Uh, more programming stuff. Uh, so, so as we keep adding new things every year, um, there exists more opportunities for bugs to exist or things to go wrong. For example, in the recent few years, um, the Vuforia uh, image processing technology was added, which gives teams a lot of power in terms of visually identifying their surroundings via the robot. But it's also a fairly complicated set of code. So one thing to keep in mind is Although the latest features are exciting and give you more opportunities, they also are going to come hand in hand with um, some potential software bugs as kind of FTC is kind of a, a niche application and um, it's going to take a little testing for the kinks to get wired out. So just kind of be aware, um, you know, whenever you're using something new that uh, if something weird's going on, it might not be you, it might be a bug in the framework SDK, et cetera. Um, if you find something reproducible, of course, make sure to document the behavior, find exactly how it reproduces, save your log files, and report it to the FTC developers, um, such as on the FTC technology forums, or perhaps uh, as an issue in the GitHub. Uh, also remember that uh, the tournament venue, if you go to an in-person event, or if you just uh, meet up with a bunch of uh, fellow teams for a uh, session of doing officially recorded remote matches, uh, when there's more robots, there's going to be uh, a more difficult environment than testing by yourself in your um, in your uh, comfort of your own home, for example. There'll be more Wi-Fi signals flying around. There's going to be um, different temperature and humidity conditions. For example, uh, you know, it might be drier, colder, um, especially if it's in like a, a gym or an open environment rather than a, a small closed environment. And of course, there's going to be more things bumping your robot which could cause uh, strange events to occur, disconnects and uh, cables and things like that and other potential problems. Uh, and so it's always important to be, repa be prepared. We've mentioned a couple of these topics before, but having spares of things is always a good idea, whether it's batteries, um, robot controller phones, game pads, USB cables, uh, other cables, uh, rev hubs, if you can afford that. Um, unpowered USB hubs for uh, your game pads. Worst case scenario uh, for you is something breaks and then you have a spare to replace it. Best case scenario, you don't need it and maybe you can help another team uh, recover from a really bad day if one of their parts goes wrong and they don't know what to do. So some extra precautions. Um, just to just in terms of thinking about things that you're going to be doing uh, during the matches and, and in gameplay, you're going to want to make sure your batteries are recharged uh, on your phone and uh, and robot. Uh, restart your phones as much as possible before you start your matches to make sure that your USB connections, your general operating system behavior, and all that fun stuff is working as intended. Um, this can also help mitigate gamepad connection issues which can happen if your phones have been on and connected for a long time. Um, if you have uh, static electricity issues because it's a little dry and cold, um, you could try using dryer sheets to give your robot a wipe down to suck up all that extra charge. 
Uh, or similarly, when you're walking up to the field, you can discharge or rather neutralize the robot with the field environment by touching metal on the robot to metal the field walls, just to make sure you're starting at the same charge level as the field. And also, you know, be, be cognizant of uh, w doing things like scraping your shoes on the, uh, the field bats and other things that are going to generate charge as you're holding the robot. When in doubt, um, for you, those of you who are rookie teams or only have a year or so of experience, uh, feel free to ask a veteran team. Most of them are more than happy to help out and have a lot of really great knowledge. In some cases, they have more knowledge than even the uh, volunteers from having you know, been in, in the field and working on things and seeing issues firsthand. The more people have their robots operating, the more fun there is for everybody. Um, there's also a list of resources here that teams can utilize to uh, learn more information. You've got the uh, First Inspires resource library for technology and robot building. Um, there's some other guides, such as the robot wiring guide. Uh, there's the um, FTC technology forum. Um, good place to go and check and see if anybody has issues with you and maybe communicate with the uh, first engineers. And of course, we have the GitHub. Um, now, the GitHub, last year, they changed it to be a season-specific repository. Um, last I checked a day or two ago, they haven't issued the new repository for this game year yet. So we'll have to keep an eye and see when that finally comes out. But they have been um, doing all their changes up till now in the Skystone repository from last year, rather than the uh, generic um, FTC GitHub that you may remember from two years and, and further ago for those of you who've been around for a while. Uh, so moving on, some extra things, to, some more things to consider uh, in terms of experiences you'll have on the field. Uh, so, you know, this year, obviously, we're going to be having some remote tournaments. We'll see if we end up having uh, in-person traditional tournaments again. Um, in remote play, you have a lot more leeway for uh, optimizing the conditions of your robot. Uh, you know, you get a, a certain, I think, period of seven days or something like that around a um, certain time to submit your match results. Um, so you have a lot more opportunity to prepare and make sure that everything's uh, in tip-top shape. Um, but if you do end up doing some remote events um, and then later you do a traditional event, you're going to want to be aware of the uh, significant differences between the two um, for those of you who are new teams and are not familiar with this. So you're going to have a limited amount of time to set up your robot before a match. It can be fairly hectic running back and forth between the pit and the field and your matches and trying to do repairs or code updates and you got other things going on. Um, so you'll, you'll find that compared to remote events where it can be quite leisurely, uh, an in-person tournament, uh, in tournament can be quite hectic uh, and difficult to stay on top of everything. Um, and when you're on the field, you don't have a whole lot of time to get your robot set up. Um, in fact, uh, if you take too long, you can actually get a penalty for delay of game. So it's important to try and be as prepared as possible when you leave your pit going up to the field. Um, unlike uh, many years past, there is uh, no period between autonomous and driver control in order to perform uh, fixes, robot unflippings, uh, power button switch ons and things like that. So you got to be as careful as possible to make sure nothing goes wrong in autonomous to prevent you from operating in driver control. On occasion, um, delays can pop up, for example, the first match of the day waiting for opening ceremonies, um, and you might be putting your robots out in the field for several minutes. Um, you're going to want to be careful about this because it could result in battery drains, um, connection timeouts, uh, screen turnoffs, um, programs timing out, and generally causing things to not work as they're supposed to. There's some steps you can take to mitigate this, for instance, going into your Android settings and adjusting your screen timeouts, uh, I think there's like a connection timeouts in the Wi-Fi section and things like that, um, just to make sure that everything is um, set to make sure you don't break everything when you have to wait for 10 minutes. Uh, be sure to double check the state of your robot after any delays. Uh, make sure that uh, your robot connection is working, your ping times, you got the right program selected, all that fun stuff, um, just to make sure that when you do press play, everything happens as expected. Uh, some more things to think about as you're doing remote events and perhaps doing some in-person events later in the year. Um, there's a lot of things that you're going to have to worry about on the field uh, in, in, uh, with multiple robots. 
that don't really occur uh, when you're testing on your own. If you're just running your own raw, you have a lot finer control over where it's going, uh, making sure it doesn't run into things. But if there's three other robots on the field with you, it can get a little hectic, um, bumping into each other, electrostatic discharge between robots, uh, robots bumping you into walls, things like that. Um, this often, these, these differences in conditions can also result in the, um, the appearance that, you know, everything works great in practice and that nothing works on the competition fields. Uh, those of you who've been around for a few times may be uh, nodding your head here. Um, however, it is expected that teams build a robot to compete in the tournament environment and not in the perfect conditions of their practice field. So it's your responsibility to try and plan ahead and deal with as many of the uh, real world disruptions as possible. So you're going to always want to think about um, things that could be different in the tournament on a competition field as opposed to in your own uh, you know, local school or home practice fields or uh, half fields for, for, for uh, submitting remote results. Um, also keep in mind, um, for those of you who are new teams, uh, the technology differences. This year, the Rev Control Hub is one of the major changes that's gone forward. Um, they were piling it in a few places last year, and now it's available for everybody to use. I think it kind of simultaneously represents a great opportunity to throw out some of the uh, old problems like USB connections but will remain to be seen uh, whether or not it adds any new problems since we're you now putting the entire brains uh, built into the Rev Control Hub. So we'll have to keep an eye on how that uh, evolves. Keep an eye on the technology forums um, for uh, see if anybody has issues to be aware of. Uh, as far as practicing, it's a good idea to get real world playing experience as early as often possible. Um, so you're going to want to do, um, well, scrimmages, we'll see how that turns out, um, if we get any organized and if we're allowed to do in-person meetups. But uh, even if you, um, you know, don't get to do an in-person scrimmage, uh, just doing practice matches on a full field, like you're simulating a full match, um, you know, doing it from start to finish, um, trying to get set up quickly and running quickly, uh, and just generally trying to keep in mind a, a tournament experience as much as possible. You may also want to organize practice matches with nearby teams if there are not any uh, officially hosted scrimmages nearby. Um, additionally, if we get back to those uh, in-person tournaments, um, you might want to take a look at seeing if you can do more than one qualifier if there is space available in the sign-up slots, um, just to get as much practice experience as possible. And similarly, a lot of teams like to do out-of-state qualifiers for nearby states like Kentucky or Indiana. Um, of course, they also have their own restrictions on allowing out-of-state um, participants, so you'll have to check on availability there. Um, you're also going to want to keep an eye on the, uh, the FTC forums or the FTC subreddit or basically any other community hubs for FTC to uh, see what other teams are saying, if they're encountering issues, workarounds, if they've got tips and tricks. Uh, just basically stay engaged because, you know, you're not alone in this. There's a whole other worldwide community of, of people doing the same thing as you. And always remember, if you encounter uh, something weird, uh, you know, make a post about it. Uh, tell us what you know and helps us try to fix it and figure out what's going on. Um, some more stuff for remote matches here. Um, so some things to keep in mind. Uh, you're going to want to make sure that when you're setting up your remote matches that your playing field is as consistent as possible for repeatability. So some things you might not think about, uh, you know, are the lighting conditions the same? If you've got sensors reading uh, color or light levels or euphoria or things like that, if your light levels change significantly, maybe you've got some lights or lamps turned on or off, or you're at a different section or a different area even, a different building location, um, that can throw off your sensors and make for an inconsistency between your runs. Um, whereas like in a tournament venue, you know, it's going to be in the same location with the same lights and all that. So it'll be fairly consistent uh, throughout the day. Um, some other things to think about are temperature and humidity. Um, you know, if it's getting cold and dry, you might see some more static issues pop up versus if it's warmer and more humid. So that's something to keep in mind as well, um, especially if you start seeing problems popping up that weren't there before. Um, to control static, uh, depending on the time of year, whether you encountered it or not, um, there's a couple options you have available. Um, the simplest method is to just simply get a bottle of water and do a light misting uh, on the field every, 
I think 10 to 15 minutes or so uh, in order to kind of raise the local humidity of the field and discharge static that may try to accumulate on the tiles uh, into the air via the water. If you want to take the next step, you can use a commercial anti-static spray, such as the Staticide brand. However, be aware that um, applying this will change the texture of your playing field a little bit to make it a little stickier and tackier. So you're going to want to take that into mind before you choose that option. Um, it may require some washing off later if you want to uh, reuse those tying tiles because the tape doesn't like to stick on the uh, anti-static surface. Uh, an alternative, more manual method is to utilize dryer sheets to wipe down the surfaces. Um, you could do just the playing field elements, the um, game elements, or you could also uh, wipe down the foam surfaces as well to uh, suck up all that charge in the dryer sheets. And of course, your robot as well is, is candidate for dryer sheet wiping. Uh, another option you might take um, if you're experiencing particularly dry conditions is to simply set up a humidifier in the room. Of course, you're going to want to make sure that's placed well away from the playing field robot and electronics. Uh, you would not want to be <laughs> spraying a fine mist directly onto your robot. But raising the overall humidity of the room could be an option to consider if all else fails. All right, that's all we've got for presented stuff here. So if you guys want to start coming up with questions, uh, I will do my best to answer them in our remaining time here. Ah, the water game preparations, yes. Well, I recommend yeah, you invest in uh, some waterproofing solutions, uh, sealants, um, and uh, generally things that float. Does anyone have any more questions for Alex? If not, Alex, do you want us to tell? I'm going to no. Oh, someone just said no. Brilliant. Speak um, to everybody, huh? <laughs> um, Alex, tell us. Um, your want, tell us just a, if you if you want tell us a story about uh, you being FTC, being an FTC as an FTA as a lead FTA. What's something that comes up as being uh, memorable to you, either in a funny way or uh, in a in an actual you know meaningful way? I'm just trying to get conversation flowing. So if you want to tell a story, you can. I guess I don't know. Well, there's, there's a couple particular incidents that stand out. Um, I remember there was a, a match or two, actually, where um, some robots uh, stopped working in the middle of the match, and we were all scratching our heads, and then we realized that the power switch had been turned off by another robot inadvertently uh, pressing it with an arm. Uh, <laughs> uh, just another reason why you want to make your, uh, your robot built uh, in a way that is uh, resistant to foreign interaction. I've also uh, seen some robots that uh, get bumped or run into something and then either their battery packs or even worse, their Android phones fall out. Uh, and then hilariously, uh, they still remain connected and then the team is driving around with their battery or, or their, uh, their smartphone hanging out of the robot akin to uh, dragging your heart or brains around on the ground. Always very entertaining. Until they don't work, of course, then it's not entertaining at all. Uh, let's see here. I have uh, not encountered any robots setting on fire yet, so that's that's good. Um, oh, we. Oui. There, ha there have been uh, a, a few instances of motor burnouts here or there, but it gets uh, more and more rare as the motor tech improves. Right, yeah. Yeah. Coming from FRC, uh, at least for myself, there was a very particular moment where we were at a competition and a robot just shot up in flames and that was like, oh no, that's not good at all. Um, ooh, we have a question. This is one interesting one. Have there been any purposeful sabotages? Uh, purposeful sabotage. That's yeah. That's a hot topic issue. Everybody always wants to think that uh, any Wi-Fi interference is always sabotage. Right. Um. So there are certainly uh, some vulnerabilities, shall we say, in the the Wi-Fi protocol communication. Um, I know I've been setting up uh, equipment and experimenting <laughs> on my side to be able to detect these. Um, it's certainly possible. Um, whether or not we've 
found any or not, uh, it's very difficult to get a positive confirmation because the uh, tracing required to identify that essentially involves identifying the packets and then figuring out who's sending them and then tracing them by signal strength or something like that. Um, so have there been? Uh, I will say there have been some instances where robots seem to magically stop working right when endgame comes around. Um, as for the exact cause, uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, it's difficult to tell. It is, it is amazing how worked up people get over uh, high school robot competitions where there is uh, not any particular large prize monies involved. Right. It's not very gracious or professional. So we have another question from Bryn. Do the judges show, wow, okay. Do the judges show favoritism towards veteran or well-known teams compared to rookie team? That's a good question, actually. It is a good question. Um, I would actually, I'm, you know, I am an FTA and not a judge, but I would almost say it's the reverse. Um, right. Where yeah. judges actually are more likely to look for outstanding rookie teams um, compared to, uh, you know, the, the weld and tried and true veterans. Uh, that being said, you know, if a veteran's doing great, I think they're going to continue to acknowledge that. But I, I definitely don't think rookies are getting snubbed if they uh, show up and stand out. Yeah, no, I, told, I, 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 I agree, essentially, yeah. So anytime a rookie team, um, you know, gets it out of their comfort zone, right, just starting an FTC team, that's such a big step to take. Um, anything that you guys do as a rookie um, is going to impress us as judges. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're all good. Yeah. If anything, um, you know, the veteran teams are kind of the ones who are more likely to uh, try extra hard to win. So you got to keep an extra eye on them to see if they try to uh, skirt the very edges of the rules. <laughs> oh, yeah. I will say, as an FTA... Um, I don't know if it's favoritism, but I, I do like the, the uh, veteran teams quite a lot because they often know more than me about some of the nitty gritty technical details. So if I'm finding something particularly baffling, you know, I might go and hunt down a veteran team and see if they know something about it because, you know, they're, they're the ones dealing with it every day in and out. So, you know, I don't have robots in my, uh, in my house here. So <laughs> all I'm, all my experiences from, you know, third party observation versus uh, first party involvement. So veteran teams, definitely a useful resource. What things do I like to see teams do that make my job as an FTA easier? Oof, oh, so many, so many things. Um, paying attention to your software versions, paying attention and getting everything up to date, um, wiring your robot well, um, making sure your connections are reinforced, uh, making sure that uh, you don't have wires around around every single metal part of your robot, um, making sure your phone is visible and in a convenient and easily accessible holder or with a flip open uh, shield. Um, what else we got here? Uh, having a nice um, stand or something like that uh, so that you can see their driver stations. Um, <laughs> paying attention to holding their driver stations so they're not tugging the wires out every three seconds. <laughs> Making sure Android Studio Cradle's in offline mode. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of things you can do. I will say uh, one thing, it's 11 o'clock, but I think we got a little bit of downtime here between things. Um, one of the things that's new this year in the rules is that it is uh, mandated that you have to have your app versions matching and your firmware um, for the rev hubs at a minimum version, um, which is one great way to avoid weird problems popping up. I usually check this during field inspections, but I know it's not super common um, for it to be inspected. So pay extra attention to that. 
uh, make sure your versions match. And if all, all, all possible, you're at the latest firmware versions for Rev stuff. There's uh, instructions on how to do that on Rev's website. All right. Um, if nobody's got any more questions here, uh, we'll let you guys go. And Alex, it's Jody. Um, it's Jody. I have two quick announcements for the room. Okay. First, as you all know, there is a code word challenge and contest. The code word for this session is quantum computing. So good luck to everyone um, if you're keeping track of those. And then the second announcement is simply the next Zoom session is the team roundtable, which is in room one. Yep, so this room, unfortunately, so very sad. I've gotten to know all 26 people very well uh, that will be closing this room. But anyway, thank you so much for participating. Do you have any, um, I'll close in about a couple more minutes to let everyone dwell out. But other than that, thank you again. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.